Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. MTSU has officially become the first university in Tennessee to offer special counseling services to help veterans transition into the college environment. It's called Vet Success. MTSU and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs announced the Vet Success program during a special signing ceremony on the MTSU campus. Our mutual goal is to ease the transition of veterans from combat to our campus. Middle Tennessee State is the, the first and as of now the only um, university in, in Tennessee um, that we've partnered with, um, one of 16 nationally. The Vet Success Partnership will provide on-campus career and vocational planning to help veterans make an easier adjustment to campus life. MTSU professor Cliff Ricketts is at it again. This time, the alternative fuels researcher successfully drove coast to coast 2,582 miles on less than three gallons of gas. That's right, just 2.15 gallons of fuel. Ricketts started his trip on Tybee Island on the Atlantic coast of Georgia on March 4th in a converted 1994 Toyota Tercel and a 2005 Toyota Prius using solar and hydrogen alternative fuels, or as he likes to say, sun and water. The initial leg of the trip, 500 miles, destination MTSU. Probably the greatest accomplishment that we did of the whole trip was not the 2.15 gallon. We went over a third across the country on nothing but hydrogen from water separated from the sun. And I think that's what's probably the most phenomenal thing about the trip. But with the Iran nuclear and the Israel thing, if I was to break out, I have no doubt that gas would get to $10 a gallon. And, and what we're showing is if, we, if it does get that price, we have a process here on this campus, uh, in this building, in the Alternative Fuel Lab, we have a model so that every commuter in the country, we could show them how to run off sun and water. Ricketts is quick to admit converting to sun and water won't and happen overnight, but he has demonstrated there's an alternative. On March 5th, Ricketts and his eight-member team of experts and students headed to Long Beach, California on I-40 for the remaining 2,000 miles. In addition to the 94 Tercel, they also drove the 2005 Prius using solar and hydrogen to Conway, Arkansas. Then the team used a plug-in hybrid 2007 Prius for the last roughly 1,600 miles using 95% ethanol and 5% gas, just 2.15 gallons, and electric, two 10 kilowatt hour battery packs to reach Long Beach. He plans another trip totally on sun and water in 2013. Well, every year, the John Pless Faculty Award is presented to an MTSU faculty member who has contributed significantly to the teaching, research, and service of African Americans. This year, Dr. Cheryl Slaughter Ellis, Professor of Community and Public Health in the Department of Health and Human Performance, was recognized during a special ceremony at the MTSU Foundation House. But she always had this commitment to help to increase the awareness of the prevention of diabetes, STDs, stroke, heart, heart disease, and other preventive conditions. Dr. Ellis joined the MTSU faculty in 1985, and it was she who instigated the Pless Award in 1997 to honor her colleague for his contributions to MTSU through teaching, mentoring, and public service. Another big name visitor to the MTSU campus, Oscar winner Marley Matlin of Children of a Lesser God fame, delivered a keynote address for Women's History Month. At just 21, Matlin became the youngest Best Actress Oscar recipient. Deaf since the age of 18 months, Matlin communicates in sign language in her acting and public appearances. The author of four books, her movie credits include Walker, The Player, and Hear No Evil. And MTSU alumnus Jeff Reed, an executive producer for CNN Productions in Atlanta, paid a visit to the campus to tour the new Center for Innovation in Media. Reed, who is a cornerstone donor to the new media center, applauds the center for providing students with hands-on experience. But in this business, you have to have some hands-on experience. And from what I'm seeing here today, you're providing students just that. When they walk out of here, they'll have their degree, but they can also have that resume reel or Nowadays, everything's online, uh, that link that they could point to and say, look, not only 
is this what I've learned, but this is what I can do. Be sure to join us next month as we feature a behind the scenes look at how the new Media Convergence Center is training MTSU students in cutting edge technology and collaboration. Well, hundreds of fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students from across Middle Tennessee gathered in MTSU's Murphy Center to show they have the imaginative power to invent. The 20th Annual Invention Convention featured games and ways to make life easier. Boys and girls, I congratulate you. I'm so proud of you. I'm happy that you're here. You are an inventor. Well, we decided to do the backpack umbrella because we pass MTC, MTSU every day, at least I do, and it's always raining and people are wanting to text on their phones, so we decided to make the backpack umbrella. And so you don't have to hold the backpack, it's just stuck into your backpack and it's stable so you can text without getting wet. And today we have 479 children with 238 inventions, so we've grown quite a bit over the years. Two MTSU professors, one adjunct and another retired, have teamed up to publish a revised textbook for undergraduates to study law and the U.S. legal system. Professor Emeritus Thomas Vandervoort and adjunct Professor David Hudson, Jr. of the First Amendment Center have added six new chapters to the larger third edition. They want students and laymen to have a deeper grasp of case and code law as well as legal principles and procedures. Well, even if you haven't seen the Oscar-nominated movie Moneyball starring Brad Pitt, no doubt you've heard about the huge bonuses being offered high school baseball players to go pro. An MTSU graduate student researched the topic and published an article on the real Moneyball question. He discussed it recently on WMOT 89.5 FM. Seen in this photo, a number of Blue Raiders are now playing professional baseball, mostly in the minor leagues. Michael McHenry is battling to be the Pirates' starting catcher in the big leagues. Before playing college baseball, some had to make a big decision, whether to go pro right out of high school or go to college. It's an immense amount of pressure that, have, that are put on the kids and their families, really. And, you know, the, the way to combat that and to make the best decision is, you know, through information and doing your homework. You're MTSU high, graduate student vote. Mitchell Woltering, who MTSU serves as a student vote. manager for the MTSU baseball team, recently wrote an article for collegesportsbusinessnews.com weighing the real Moneyball question. When is college the better choice for MLB drafted high school baseball players? You know, really that's, that's why I wanted to dive into this subject and write this because it's difficult to find all this information about the draft, you know, about what you can expect for a signing bonus. It's hard to find that, you know, centrally located. So. Woltering analyzed the first 10 rounds of the last 10 years of the MLB draft and found that high school players typically sign for more money than college draftees because high school players have the most leverage they'll ever have. So that's why you consistently see, you know, it doesn't matter what the round, the pick, the position, it doesn't matter high school players get more money for a signing bonus than college players do. This runs counter to the typical notion that a college graduate will make more money. Woltering's research found that of the 136 players drafted during the first 10 rounds that decided not to sign out of high school, only 40 percent were drafted a second time at a higher spot. That's going to push them more towards signing right away, just knowing that, you know, only 40 percent of guys who are turning down the money are getting drafted higher. You can hear this and other MTSU interviews on the record on WMOT-FM 89.5, Mondays at 5.30 and Sundays at 8 a.m. or at WMOT.org. I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue.
This is not just a recording studio. This is not just a flight school. This is not just a university. This is MTSU, home of Tennessee's best. In our cover story this month, we sat down for backstage interviews with five talented performers, actors from the London stage. The theater company, based in London, aims to present Shakespeare so audiences and students can understand it in its purest form. Just another example of how MTSU Arts brings top class performances to the MTSU campus. In this case, Shakespeare's comedy, Twelfth Night. And there's a reason why the stories are still uh, played. I'd say the reason why people, a lot of people don't like Shakespeare is because they've had to study it. If music be the food of love, play on. It, he's got the first line and the last line, so you think, great, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a strong position to be in. And he says, if music be the food of love, play on. And he has that whole thing about his feelings towards Olivia. The Countess Olivia's household. The Countess Olivia. Oh, when mine eyes did see Olivia first. And he describes Olivia briefly, just says, she's beautiful. I'm Viola. At the beginning of the play, we meet her, and she's shipwrecked onto this country called Illyria. What country, friends, is this? This is Illyria, lady. And she thinks that she's lost, or her brother is drowned in the ocean. My brother, he is in Elysium. But Chancy is not drowned. What think you, sailor? She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know this country, and she doesn't know how to go forward because her brother was the only thing she had left in her life, and now he's drowned. So she starts off the play in a bit of a, a state. It's Sebastian, who I play, her identical twin brother. I'm Sebastian, her identical twin brother. He has a huge journey through the play of thinking he's lost his sister. He has the most beautiful speeches about the loss of her. For such disguise as happily shall become the form of mine intent. Then she gets this idea that there's a duke and there's um, a countess, but the countess is obviously in mourning and will admit no men. Whereas the duke, she thinks, well, hold on, I've got an idea. I could dress up as a man. Be you his eunuch and your mute I'll be. When my tongue... You know, I, know, I know how to hold court and I might be able to sway him so much that I could become his right-hand man. So she does, she dresses up as a man called Cesario and goes in and meets the Duke Orsino and suddenly they, she falls in love with him and uh, she does her job very well, so well, she, the Duke says to her that he's in love with Olivia, please go and woo Olivia for me. If she be so abandoned to her sorrows as it is... She does it so well that Olivia ends up falling in love with Cesario, which obviously is a woman, but she doesn't know that because I'm dressed as a man. I know thy constellation is right apt for this affair. <laughs> These clothes be good enough to drink in. He's the uncle of Olivia, and he's a drunk. How have you come so early by this lethargy? Lechery! I defy lechery! <laughs> and bored, I think. He just wants some fun. Twelfth Night tradition was a time when, between Christmas and Twelfth Night, anarchy really ruled, so anything went, and they used to have a lord of misrule who would kind of deliberately sort of subvert any um, established order of things. So for Belch it's a great time, because it means he can go out and he can drink whenever he wants. Andrew A. Buchik, he is as tall a man as any is in an area. Early on he sort of says, oh you know, I'm, I'm out with this guy, Andrew A. Buchik, and I'm drinking every night, but I'm drinking healths to my niece. I will drink to her while there is a passage in my throat and 
drink in Illyria. And he's currently fallen in with a very wealthy but rather stupid uh, man called Andrew Egichi, who's a sir. And we find out that he's had, oh God, every cheek's worth 3,000 ducats a year, which equates to about half a million pounds. So whatever that would be, three quarters of a million dollars or so a year. But he's the sort of person that if you went out for a night with him, you know, you'd wake up in the morning in your underpants tied to a telegraph pole somewhere. You know. um, but you'd have had a good time. <laughs> So he's a, bit, he's a bit like that, he's a bit like Falstaff, so like, you, when you meet him, you think, oh, he's a good laugh, he's ever so nice, but he's kind of, um, he kind of goes too far, I think. I'll ride home tomorrow. The Andrew Egechi, I, I stand with a, a concave chest, my arms are like sort of floating around like this, but that kind of came from the inside out, actually, a very sort of, uh, I kind of understood him quite quickly, he's a coward, he's scaredy cat, he's a weird boaster, he knows he's ridiculous, he knows everyone thinks he's a fool. First question for thou cease to not care by nature, but if the dishonest man mend himself, if he mend, he is no longer dishonest. And Feste is, is, is a mad part, he describes himself as being a corrupter of words rather than a fool, and it sort of means that what you're doing is you're taking Elizabethan language and the, their sentence structure and some words that we don't really use much these days. If it will not, uh, what remedy? As there is no true couple but calamity, so... And he's twisting them. As a squash is before it is a peas car. Uh, and uh, Olivia has a, a steward, a butler kind of a thing, uh, and he's called Malvolio. And a very sort of rather formal man who is in love with himself, in love with his voice, in love with the way he looks, uh, quite <clears throat> puritanical in, 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 actually. And uh, probably, probably the thinking is at the time, you know, the Puritan movement in Britain around the late 1500s, not particularly popular, quite pu purist in that they were Puritans, uh, you know, frowning on. Twelfth night festivities, frowning on parties, frowning on this, you know. So the play really, to some degree, is about the uh, the you know, pulling the carpet underneath the puritanical element of probably England at the time. She's in pain, sir. She'll endure wind and weather. You've got the Countess Olivia. I mean, everybody knows right at the beginning. It's repeated again and again that she, her father's died, followed very quickly by her brother's death. Um, and she has chosen f to be in mourning for seven years and part of that mourning period is I'm not going to have anybody approach my house and I'm not going to be anywhere near a man for seven years. That's it. So it's not that she doesn't want to fall in love, it's that she's told herself that she can't. I am a gentleman. I'll be sworn thou art. She's just fallen in love with this, what she thinks is a young boy which of course we know is not, it's Viola. Um, Olivia falls in love with a woman who looks like a man. So yeah, I think they're all mistaken and they all learn something, you would hope, about um, not judging a book by its cover. Would you have a love song or a song of good life? A love song. A love song. I, I, I care not for good life. <laughs> Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Oh, stay and hear your true love's coming. What Shakespeare does in those plays, and in this play, he presents you with what's the norm. Oh, this is a play about mistaken identity. Fantastic, this will be funny. But what he then makes you do is he makes you go a step further and think about it in another way. So meeting, every wise man's son doth know. Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Stay and heed your true love's coming. And we'll strive to please you every day. Living as so many of us do on automatic pilot most of the time, not living a true life, an authentic life, a a reflective life.
We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. Finally, on Out of the Blue, Dr. Bob Pondillo wants to make sure that you're still getting a thrill out of life. Remember the song Jack and Diane from John Mellencamp's 1982 American Fool album? He sang the, the line, uh, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. I loved that song when I first heard it. It was happy and it felt authentic and I loved the driving snare drum. But those lyrics, long after the thrill of living is gone, they puzzled me. In 1982, I was 31 years old, and the notion of losing the thrill of living never occurred to me. In fact, I'm pretty sure I thought that, as life proceeded back then, I was living in its thrill. Well, three decades later, and after careful reflection, I don't think I was living in the thrill of life at all, not back then. 30 years ago, I was locked in a job I disliked and kept at for all the wrong reasons, one of which was the money. And I was, a, I was in a dysfunctional marriage and I wasn't mature enough to make that work. And, and I had no real friends because my narcissism prevented me from being a real friend. And I was just afraid of so many things. Why? Mindlessness. Living as so many of us do on automatic pilot most of the time. Not living a true life, an authentic life, a, a reflective life to one's nature. And while I worked in a career that I was pretty good at, that career wasn't good for me. So what I lived in and lived through at that time was not really the thrill of life at all, but the self-inflicted pain of life, all those years of senseless pain. That's kind of sad, but at least I realized it and did something about it. And it took me another 20 years or so to fix things, but I did. And I know I'm better off for it. And often, heading back to college is a good place to start, at least it was for me. I mention this in the hope that if something doesn't seem right or if the thrill of living is gone in your life, maybe, maybe you should take a long critical look to see why. Are you living a mindless, thrillless life? Are you in a job or relationship that's emotionally unsuitable for you? Because life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone and it's going on right now. And if it's going on without you and you're not feeling that thrill, even occasionally, and perhaps you owe it to yourself to do all the hard things you need to do to reinvent your life and change things. And then jump back in and feel that thrill again, or who knows, feel it maybe for the first time. For Out of the Blue, I'm Bob Pondillo. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Until next time, go blue. Join us in celebrating 100 years of MTSU history. 
Check out the Centennial Timeline at mtsu.edu slash centennial.